Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to this class. In this class, we are going to study yet another important clinical condition which is going to produce morbidity in the sexually active population that is the non-gonococcal urethritis. In this class, the objectives are that we are going to learn about non-gonococcal urethritis, the causative agents and how do we proceed with the lab diagnosis of such conditions. The topic will be dealt under the following headings that we are going to learn taking an example of a case which presented with non-gonococcal urethritis. We are going to study about its epidemiology, the clinical features, complications and the treatment of individual etiological agent involved. At the same time, we are going to learn about the organisms which are involved in causing this condition and also the laboratory diagnosis in detail about this condition. Let us proceed. This was a case 32 year old male who presented with burning maturation since about a week. He also had urethral discharge which was non purulent for the last two days and also there was itching present in the genital area in this particular person. The history of presenting illness here was that the patient had unprotected sex with a new partner about 3 weeks ago. There was no particular constitutional symptoms which were involved, no history of similar illness in the past. When the clinical examination was conducted in this patient, then no abnormality was detected here. Going with the clinical presentation, it was quite clear that the patient was suffering from urethritis. This was a clinical diagnosis. Let us know that what are some of the etiological agents which can cause urethritis. When we hear this word urethritis, the first thing which comes to our mind is gonorrhea, gonococcal urethritis. However, we have to also keep in mind that the organisms other than Neisseria gonorrhea can also be involved in causing this particular condition. The other organisms which are involved here can be chlamydia group of organisms which are the next commonest cause, mycoplasma which can be involved here. The same group mycoplasma also contains another important organism urea plasma similar to mycoplasma could be another cause. The parasites like trichomonas vaginalis and the bacterium gardnerella vaginalis can also lead into non-gonococcal urethritis. In this particular condition, it was important to go for laboratory diagnosis to confirm the clinical diagnosis and also to establish the etiology because as we know bacteria, parasites and the fungi and others can also be involved. It is important to diagnose and establish the etiology so that the specific therapy prevention and control of the disease can be initiated. Going in this line, urethral discharge was collected on sterile swab and it was transported to the laboratory immediately and also blood sample was collected here to carry out any required serological tests. We have to keep in mind that the organisms which are involved in this condition are particularly fastidious and delicate. Thus, it is important to note here that the samples to be collected on the swabs other than cotton swab because the cotton swab can have toxic effects on the organisms and hence decrease the yield of these organisms. The sample was collected and it was sent to the laboratory. 
In the laboratory, we have various modalities of diagnosis. We had no evidence of presence of any organisms or bacteria. In this picture, you can see that there are inclusion bodies stained brown in color due to the presence of glycogen. Other stainings which can be considered are the Gimsa stain, Castaneda stain, immunofluorescence staining, etc. Other modes of diagnosis available are culture, serology and molecular techniques. Culture is going to be quite difficult and complex procedure in case of chlamydial infections. We have to employ some tissue cells, tissue culture methods employing some mouse cells or McCoy cells. The organisms could also be grown easily on yolk sac of chick embryo. Serological methods as compared to culture are more easy, rapid and convenient. ELISA test is available. In this case, ELISA test turned out to be positive for chlamydial antigens. Complement fixation test, microimmunofluorescence test are some of the others. Skin test is yet another mode of diagnosis. In this particular test, what is done is the antigens derived from the yolk sac cultured chlamydial organisms is derived and this antigen is injected intradermally in the forearm of the patient. At the end of 2 to 4 days, if there is nodule formation more than 10 millimeters in size is considered as the positive test. Molecular diagnostic methods available are the nucleic acid amplification test, DNA probe, PCR and chemiluminescence tests. What do you think he is suffering from? Yes, you are right. He is suffering from the non-gonococcal urethritis of course caused due to chlamydia. Why we got into diagnosis of this particular condition is that patient came with dysuria, non-purulent urethral discharge, history of sexual exposure and gram stain showed only the presence of pus cells and no evidence of any organisms. This made us think clinically as well as microbiologically diagnosis was non-gonococcal urethritis caused due to chlamydial group of organisms. When we got the diagnosis, report was informed to the physician so that he would start with specific treatment. The drug of choice here in chlamydial infections causing non-gonococcal erythritis is azithromycin. The patient was put on azithromycin and patient recovered uneventfully. In this case, the treatment was important because otherwise the patient would have gone in for some of the complications which are usually expected if it is not detected timely and the treatment is not given specifically. With the discussion of the last case, we have learned that we had a case of non-gonococcal urethritis by clinical as well as by laboratory help we have diagnosed it as non-gonococcal urethritis caused by chlamydia group of organisms. We are going to now learn more about the non-gonococcal urethritis what it is, what is its epidemiology, what are the clinical presentations, the etiology, complications, treatment as well as pathogenesis. We will consider different etiological agents individually and we will discuss about them in detail including their laboratory diagnosis. Non-gonococcal urethritis as the name itself indicates, it is the infection of the urethra by the pathogens other than Neisseria gonorrhoeae. As we know that in most of the cases it is gonococcal erythritis, sometimes organisms other than Neisseria gonorrhoeae can be the causative agents. This condition is quite common worldwide, it affects more than 3 million people per year. It is equally seen in male and female group of patients. When it occurs in females, it is asymptomatic in about 50 percent of them. Among those who are infected, 10 to 40 percent are going to have pelvic inflammatory disease resulting in some of the complications like stricture of urethra, stenosis of urethra or the fallopian tubes resulting into infertility in the sexually active females. 
However, when men are affected only 1 to 2 percent of them are going to end up with the complications. This is overall picture about non-gonococcal urethritis. The first commonest cause in non-gonococcal urethritis is the chlamydial infections. Chlamydia also forms one of the important cause of sexually transmitted diseases especially non-gonococcal urethritis. They are 5 times common in females than in males and when females are affected two thirds of them are going to be asymptomatic. The complications are very well known they can be mostly related to pelvic inflammatory diseases resulting into infection of Bartholin glands, fallopian tubes, cervix as well as the adnexal tissues leading into infertility invariably. Other than involvement of pelvis and the genital tract it can also involve the eyes it can cause ocular trachoma. Trachoma are zero wars of chlamydia which are also called as a trick agents TRIC agents which mainly cause ocular trachoma and thalmia neonatorum in the children. It, they may also cause neonatal pneumonias when the children are born to mothers who are infected during pregnancy. These are some of the complications as well as infections other than non-gonococcal urethritis caused by chlamydia group of organisms. Let us learn a little more about chlamydia, their morphology, their life cycle etc. Chlamydia are gram negative coccobacilli. Their size is almost equal to size of the larger viruses. The size is around 0.3 micrometers or around 300 nanometers. They are obligate intracellular bacteria. They cannot actually produce their own ATPs. So, they depend on the host cell ATP. Hence, they are sometimes described as the energy parasites. They have a peculiar life cycle which we usually do not see in case of any bacteria. Though we know these chlamydia are bacteria, they slightly differ in some characters as related to other bacteria. The peculiar characters of this organism are that they exist in two different forms. One is the elementary form which is metabolically inactive form and the other one is the reticulate form. The reticular body is metabolically active and it is the dividing stage of the organism. Important character is that they do not have cell wall. However, the elementary bodies have got peptidoglycan layer with muramic acid which are linked by bisulfide linkages. Presence of these chemicals give the elementary body stability. Chlamydia has got a life cycle. Let us see what is this life cycle and how it goes on. The elementary body as I said is the metabolically inactive form. The elementary body is going to infect the host cells especially epithelial cells of the genital tract and the other mucous membranes. When they come across a host cell which is susceptible it is going to bind to the cell and it is going to be internalized through endocytosis. As we see here the cell the elementary body has entered into the cell. Once it enters into the cell it will go on enlarging the size is going to become almost 3 times and this particular form of matured elementary body is called as the reticulate body. The reticulate body and it starts dividing by binary fission as we are seeing here the division has started. When the division goes the host cell enlarges and you can see that the nucleus of the host cell is pushed to one side giving this particular cell the appearance of a necklace or a clam. What is a clam? Clam is like a pendant you are seeing here to this chain and this is the reason that we call these organisms as chlamydia. Chlamydia means mantle mantle is the description given to the nucleus of the host cell pushed to the periphery. So, that most of the space in the cell is occupied by the reticulate body and the cell enlarges to a great extent to the extent that it ruptures it gives away releasing all the elementary bodies into surrounding tissue. 
and newly released elementary bodies are further going to attack new susceptible cell and thus the life cycle continues. So, we have seen that this is a bacterium, but still it has got a life cycle. This bacterium is slightly different compared to other bacteria in the sense it has existence in two, di two different forms reticulate and elementary body as well as this organism lacks the cell wall. Because it lacks the cell wall, the antibiotics which act on the cell wall are not going to be effective in treating the infections caused by chlamydia organisms. Then what is the treatment? Azithromycin is the drug of choice. If the patient is suffering from non-gonococcal urethritis or cervicitis as a result of chlamydial infections, this is the drug of choice. If at all pelvic inflammatory disease is noted, then we have to treat them with ceftriaxone, metronidazole because invariably anaerobic bacteria are involved in the pelvic infections along with doxycycline. Again, in pelvic inflammatory diseases, we can treat them by IV clindamycin or gentamicin. So, this is a treatment in chlamydial infections. We have learnt about the chlamydia group of organisms, their morphology, life cycle, pathogenesis and the clinical infections caused by chlamydia group of organisms. Now, let us move on to another organism which can cause non-gonococcal urethritis. Mycoplasma are similar almost to chlamydia in the sense they are also smallest existing bacteria we have known. They are extracellular in the sense when we compare them to chlamydia, these are not going to multiply inside the cell. However, they cannot synthesize their own cholesterol, they need cholesterol, they are going to derive the cholesterol from the medium and we will be able to grow them in the complex media. Similar to the chlamydia organisms, mycoplasma also lack the cell wall, they do not get stained by gram stain because there is no cell wall, they are also going to be resistant to beta lactam group of antibiotic due to the lack of cell walls. They have complex growth requirements, they are highly fastidious in nature. They are slow grower, once we inoculate any medium with a suspected sample, we may have to wait up to 6 weeks to grow them. The examples of species in this genus, Mycoplasma hominis, Mycoplasma pneumoniae and one more Urea plasma, Urea lyticum. We may be wondering why the organism belonging to mycoplasma is called as urea plasma. It is just because these organisms can lyse, can break the urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide because of the presence of urease enzyme. Hence, they are named as the urea plasma organisms. Urea plasma is also one of the important causative agent of non-gonococcal urethritis. Mycoplasma hominis can cause non-gonococcal urethritis pyelonephritis, pelvic inflammatory diseases, infertility and postpartum fever. Mycoplasma, how can it cause the disease? It has got the adherin protein. This protein attaches to the receptors on the host cell mucosal linings and then it induces the production of autoantibodies. These autoantibodies produced against I antigen of RBCs. This reason forms the basis for development of a diagnostic test that is the cold agglutination test in mycoplasma infections. What happens here in this test is the antigen antibody reaction is going to take place at 4 degree centigrade. Thus, this reaction is called as a cold agglutination test. In this test, sometimes we may come across biological false positive reactions. Mycoplasma infections can be diagnosed by other means also, we can grow them. However, the growth is going to be quite tedious and complex. We can use serological and molecular methods for the diagnosis. The treatment is almost similar to chlamydia. They can be treated with azithromycin. Until now, no successful vaccination has been developed in treating mycoplasma infections. In this part of the lecture, we have learnt about the mycoplasma infections. They are also important cause of non-gonococcal urethritis. Let us now move on to another parasite that is Trichomonas vaginalis.
trichomonas vaginalis can present in the form of non gonococcal urethritis. It causes symptomatic and asymptomatic infections in both men and women. It is usually known to cause vaginitis with copious discharge, itching, cervicitis is also common. The cervix is inflamed severely. We can see some necrotic inflamed patches, small punctate hemorrhages. This is described as the strawberry cervix. This can be seen when we carry out our vaginal examination. This is the finding which we can note down. Trichomonas vaginalis can also cause some complications like preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes and also low birth weight. Male patients usually present with urethritis, prostatitis and epididymitis. Trichomonas vaginalis is a protozoan parasite. It is motile, a pure shaped organism and one thing to note here is that it exists only as a trophozyte not in the cyst form. This is the morphology of the organism. It is a pear shaped structure with having an four anterior flagella, one exostyle in the center and it also has a undulating membrane which covers half of the body of this parasite. The length is usually approximately about 12 to 15 micrometer. This is a life cycle of Trichomonas vaginalis. It is very simple and the life cycle goes on between human beings only, only one host involved and it has only one form that is the trophozoid form. The trophozoid form divides by binary fission and it continues its life cycle. How do we go for the lab diagnosis in this condition? The lab diagnosis of Trichomonas vaginalis is quite simple. The best method is to establish the diagnosis by having a direct visualization of the parasite in the wet mount preparation from the endocervical swabs or from the vaginal discharge itself. Wet saline mount we are going to observe for motile flagellated parasites with a typical jerky movement. For this, it is important to immediately examine the specimen. It should be usually done at the bedside without any delay. We can also go in for smear and staining by using Jimsa stain. This is one of it. We can see the same pear shaped structures with the exostyle flagella and the undulating membrane. Specific monoclonal antibody staining can also be done. Rapid antigen test can be done. It is known to be 88 percent sensitive. Culture is also possible. There is trichomonas pouch is available ready pouch with the medium already into it. We can directly inoculate the patient sample into the pouch and incubate it and after 2 to 3 days we can directly examine the pouch under microscope for the typical motility exhibited by trichomonas vaginalis. DNA probes and PCR tests are also available. Papaniculo stain can be used to have the evidence of these organisms. How do we treat trichomonas vaginalis infections? It is treated by giving oral metronidazole or tinidazole. It is also very important to treat the partners because unless we treat the partners, there is something called as a ping pong ball effect is going to happen in the sense the patient revert back to us with the similar complaints. Sometimes when only topical metronidazole is used for treatment, the treatment failure is likely to happen. In such cases, we have to go for the longer therapy and also we can sometimes change the class of drugs. What do we have to remember about this? parasite is that the infection is quite common. It is present worldwide. The parasite exists only in single form that is a trophozoid form. Males are generally asymptomatic. Though they are asymptomatic, we have to treat them if they are in contact with the patient. Drug of choice is metronidazole or tinidazole. Let us learn about another bacterium which is also the causative agent of non gonococcal urethritis that is Gardnerella vaginalis. Gardnerella vaginalis is, is a fastidious organism. It is a gram negative coccobacillus. 
usually it causes bacterial vaginosis along with anaerobic bacteria which are present in the vaginal normal flora. It presents as pruritis and dysuria. When we collect the sample, usually you can see that the sample is hemorrhagic, it is this color. It presents as pruritis and dysuria. The discharge in such cases is copious, foul smelling and having typical fishy odor. The drug of choice here is again metronidazole. One important thing in the lab diagnosis is that it is the presence of clue cells. This is a clue cell and this is the normal epithelial cell. Clue cell is nothing but the epithelial cell which is covered with plenty of organisms. The same thing is seen here, this is the clue cell. These are organisms which are covering the epithelial cell, thus giving the clue to the diagnosis that it is bacterial vaginosis. This is direct wet mount examination showing you the evidence of clue cell. The same specimen stained with Gimsa stain, we are able to see clue cells. We can see epithelial cells covered by large number of bacteria. So, the presence of clue cells is almost diagnostic of bacterial vaginosis. So, till now we have studied some of the important causative agents of non-gonococcal erythritis starting from the chlamydial group of organisms, mycoplasma, trichomonas vaginalis, gardnerella vaginalis. All of them are important group of organisms to be considered, especially their diagnosis is to be proved by laboratory investigations, so that we can initiate the specific therapy and prevent the complications. Some take home points at the end of this class, non-gonococcal erythritis should be kept in mind when a patient with urethritis comes. It need not be always gonococcal urethritis. There could be other organisms which are more fastidious. It is also one of the common sexually transmitted infection. We have to rule out non-gonococcal infections in high risk groups to prevent complications. We also have to remember that when we have gonococcal urethritis sometimes it is associated with chlamydial organisms. It is said that most of the times chlamydial organisms are involved with Neisseria group of organisms. Both of them are said to coexist. Hence, it is important to treat cases of non-gonococcal urethritis or gonococcal urethritis for both the group of organisms. I think with this we have met the objectives of this lesson, we have learnt about non-gonococcal urethritis, their etiology and the steps of laboratory diagnosis. Thank you.